Amen. So if you are one of our volunteers, you can go back with our kids, and then we'll have our kids go back in just a second, get our volunteers set, because they need to be in there before your kids go in, right? We all know what happens when all 20 kids get in there first. Okay, go ahead and go in. If you are a child, make your way down. If you're an adult and you would like to sit in a chair up here, you can move on up if you're outside. We have chairs up here. You will get a high five on the way in. That's exciting. So we do have some chairs up here if you would like to sit up here. You can. Okay, all right. So a couple of things, I have some important announcements. One of them is our next GCC Live is for our fourth through eighth graders. It's gonna be on March 17th, it is a St. Patrick's Day. And don't, you don't wanna miss that, it's gonna be at Sean and Susie's house. We're super excited for them to be able to go. Last week, they did a run the race theme, and it was amazing. We picked up our kids and they had such a good time. So your kids will not want to miss that. That's on March 17th. We have our GCC night coming up on March 28th. And that is where we are going to gather as a community for dinner up here around 5 o'clock. And then we're going to go out in the community and bless a couple families who are hurting. So a couple things with that. One, if you know a family who could use a special blessing in the form of a basket basket, and it's like a good gift basket, if you know what I mean. It's not gonna be a janky gift basket. It's gonna be a good one. If you know someone who could really use as an extra blessing in this season, please nominate them on our website. We have one family that's been nominated right now, but we really would prefer to do two or more families. So if you know somebody, please nominate them on our website. And then also, if you plan to attend that, please RSVP so we know how much food to buy for that night. So that will be March 28th up here, uh, five o'clock. So what we do is we eat together, we pray, and then we will um, pray for the families, and then we go out to drop off the baskets to them. Also, Easter is coming up. I don't know if you guys heard about that, but Easter is coming up, and the date is April? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That was really bad. I heard April 2nd, April 3rd, April 4th, and someone said May. So <laughs> let's try that again. April 4th is Easter. So good thing you guys came to church today so we all could learn something new. And yes, we're going to have a message still too. You're still going to learn more. Wow. Who would have thought? So Easter, something really exciting we're going to be offering. Does Chris know we're announcing this part? Okay. So we are having a sunrise service at Chris's house. <laughs> are we still doing that? Should I not be saying this? Just kidding. We already talked about it. I'm just being funny. So sunrise service, they have like a really beautiful backyard patio that we are going to do a sunrise service. I won't be there. So if you're coming to see me, don't worry. Uh, I won't be there. And just kidding. I know you wouldn't come to just see me anyways. That's so funny. Easter, sunrise, Chris, Chris's house. The next thing is two services. We will be offering two services at Easter because as you can see, we're already full today. Could you imagine if you wanted to bring a friend, how could you bring them? So we are going to be doing two services and the times for those are 9 and 1030. So after that, we are going to continue doing two services. More details to come about that. Ooh, yeah, okay. I've said enough jokes, so I'm going to pray now. All right. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much. God, that you are our, so, our source of hope and our source of joy. And this morning, we just got to meet with you and praise you and um, just hear these uh, beautiful voices worship you this morning. God, we thank you so much for uh, this time to hear from your word. Would you bless uh, Michael's words as they come into our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Chine. You are beautiful in every way. Good morning, GCC. How are we doing this morning? Good. 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 This guy over here is real good. I mean, it's awesome. It's my pleasure and honor to be with you guys this morning. Uh, I absolutely love the community that we've experienced in this place over the last several months. And seeing people show up early and seeing people stay late to hang out after church, this is this is a Christ-filled community if I've ever seen one, right? Like, this has just been incredible. 
I'm hearing stories of new friendships and relationships that are being formed. Um, and like when we get together, people reaching out to one another, asking for prayer, there is strength in that, right? Amen. We say in the gathering of believers, right? In the gathering of believers, we find community. And in that community, we find great strength. If you haven't been hanging out or getting to know others, man, I encourage you, stick around after church and get to know some people. This is an incredible body of believers, and you will be better for it, I promise you. So today we're in week five of our eight-week series through the book of Colossians. If you've missed any of these last four weeks, you can catch those sermons on our Facebook or YouTube pages at the GCCIE for all of it. The supremacy of Jesus is the overall theme of Colossians. That in him, in Jesus, we have everything we need to live. Amen. And not just live to survive, but in Jesus we have everything we need in order to thrive in this life. Right. That the abundant life isn't found, sorry to bust the bubble, it's not found in money or rules or spiritualism. It's found in him and in him alone. Right. When we are rooted and grounded, when we are firmly united in Christ... We are made capable by God's grace to do God's will. Can we hold to the fruits of the Spirit without and apart from Jesus? Where do the fruits of the Spirit come from? From the Spirit, right? We maybe we, we can might do this for a season, for a time. We could maybe in part hold to some of them, but ultimately without Him, it's impossible. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. Faith in who? Jesus, the Son of God. What is faith? Faith is the belief in Jesus to the extent of complete trust and reliance. To believe in, to have confidence in, to have faith and trust in Jesus. It's all in. All in Jesus, I believe. I believe. I have faith in, I trust in you. Without faith in Jesus, it's impossible to please God. Why? Because in him, as we saw in Colossians, we can find all the fullness of God. You can't attain the things of the Spirit without Him. You can fake it. You can put on a good show for a little while. But eventually the truth comes out and your character, who you are, but no one's looking, will show. And you can't keep hidden what is buried deep down in your soul. I honestly believe that God has been revealing true character in people these last several months. Did you know today... Is day 357 to 14 days to flatten the curve? <laughs> Literally. 357 day of 14 days to flatten the curve. In that time, we've seen people's true intentions and character come out. Not just government, though. This is all across the board. This whole pandemic has shown people's true character. Trust me. You can only fake godly things for a season. Who you are deep down eventually reveals itself. And the only cure to what plagues humanity is the Lord Jesus Christ. A true confession and belief in Jesus as the risen Son of God. That's where we need to start again as a church. That's where we need to start again as a people. At the feet of Jesus. Help me, Lord, know you again. Help me, Lord, be near you once more. Last week in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 23, we saw some foolish attempts at holiness or sanctification made by the people in the church in Colossae. Instead of relying on and allowing Jesus to have full reign access and rule in their lives, they sought to add a little something, something, you know, to make themselves holy. They tried legalism adding human rules and traditions to the finished work of Jesus. They tried spiritualism, puffing themselves up by, by seeking deep truths outside of God. They tried asceticism even, treating their bodies harshly in an attempt to kill the fleshly desires. Paul said, none of which have any cure for the sin problem in our lives. As we'll see today in chapter 3, Paul turned his thoughts to a more positive aspect of Christian living. The foolish attempts at sanctification found in chapter 2 often just entrap us. It's another form of bondage, right? It's the enemy making the Bible sound like it's not enough. And so people go outside of it to find what can only be found inside of the pages of this holy book, right? 
This is progressive Christianity, and it's everywhere. It's like, it's, it's everywhere. Hebrews 4.12 says this. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the what? Say it with me. Heart. Heart. In the word of God, we have life because it's his word. Alive and active. Chapter 3 of Colossians, Paul explains the nature of the Christian's higher calling and the reasons to seek out this higher living. <laughs> Although this section focuses on the Christian's new values, clearly these values, as we'll see today, are rooted in conversion. We don't need more rules or laws. We need to be transformed, converted from old self into new life. Yep. Conversion transformation happens... When we accept Jesus as our Lord, that's the start, right? Conversion includes a radical change of mind, which produces the desire for the separation from the world. Believers are made capable by God's grace to do God's will. The bottom line for us this morning is we need Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have you seen the TikTok recently? If you guys aren't on TikTok, it's fine. Neither am I. I saw it on Instagram. <laughs> but it's, it's hilarious. It's like, it's like yeah, people ask, hey, do you need Jesus in order to go to heaven? Bro, I need Jesus to go to Walmart, right? I need Jesus to be able to pump gas nowadays, right? Like, that's true. We need all of him all the time if we're to live a life worthy of God. So this morning, we're going to dive into chapter 3 of Colossians and look at what it means to be chosen, holy, and loved. Would you pray with me as we dive in? Lord Jesus, you are so good. We worship you in every way. We come before you, God. Right now, we lay down our lives. We lay down the distractions of our lives. Everything that's going on around us, we give it all to you. We ask that in every way, God, you would give us ears to hear your word. Minds to understand everything that you have and hearts to accept it and to move forward into action, into what you've called us to do. We ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's jump right in Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. This is Paul setting our focus in the right spot for the spanking that's coming this morning, okay? There's a little spanking. It's not, it's not crazy, okay? Like, I got, we're going to, we're going to get there. Anyways, Colossians chapter 3, point number one is set your focus. Set your focus. Jump in, Colossians 3, 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. It says, since you have been raised with Christ. That is speaking to those who are already believers. Remember, the Colossians are a faithful and true community of Christ followers who are being threatened by an outside influence. They are already believers. Paul said, in Jesus, we have all kinds of blessings. We have all kinds of power that we don't have apart from him, that he makes us alive. We were dead. He makes us alive. He gives us life, right? Paul was saying, since we have been raised with Christ, meaning we aren't who we once were, we are raised up as new creations, new life, new understanding, new power. He says, since then, you've been raised, set your hearts on things above where Christ is. He is, right? Seated at the right hand of God. This is Paul again reminding us to keep the main thing the main thing. Set your hearts means to seek out. The word in the Greek that means to seek out with your whole hearts is to, to, to desire it with everything that you are. Try to find it at all costs. It's this, this picture of seeking it with everything we have and everything we are. It says in the NIV, set your hearts. But in the NASB or New King James, it says, seek out things above. And that's all in. Everything that you are. What would you do if your child was lost? There's nothing you wouldn't do, right? What would you do to seek out that precious jewel if you knew it was out there? Not like you would just do it at all costs, right? People do that. That's what it means. Seek about <laughs> it's their whole self. Seek what? Seek out things above. Heavenly things. Eternal things. It's having an end game focused where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. My heart longs for it. 
is seeking those things out that are coming and have not yet arrived yet. Jesus, heaven, a new body, reunion with those who have gone on before us, right? Like, I'm so excited to see some of these people, right? Like, I can't wait to get there and see my grandmother again. Like, I can't wait to see her. It's a desire, a focus, set on and longing for eternity. Then Paul says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your minds is the same word for set your hearts. It means all of it. Set not only our hearts, our desires, but our whole mind. Let it be the forefront of our minds as well. Doesn't that sound good? Like, doesn't that sound good if we could get there? I was always told growing up, Thompson, get your head out of the clouds, right? Like, but Paul is saying, let us focus whole heart, whole mind on Jesus, on eternity. By a show of hands, how many of you have actually done this before? Think about heaven and what's coming next. Anybody? You guys think? Isn't it awesome? Isn't it awesome to think about this stuff? Like, I think about it all the time. Like, how incredible that's going to be. It's going to be so incredible, the things that we're going to get to experience. The, the sights we've never seen before, the colors that we've never seen before, the smells, the tastes. We're going to get to be with Jesus. Are you kidding me? Like this, all of that pales in comparison to standing in the light of the sun. Yeah. The son of God, right? Yeah. But then what happens? The world around us comes crashing back in, doesn't it, very quickly, keeping us grounded. <laughs> With everything going on in the world and in our lives, are we dead set focused on Jesus? Are things above, heavenly things, consuming your mind right now? What should our focus be? Jesus. What is our focus actually? Well, I need to focus on my job. I need to focus on my kids. I need to focus on my schedule. I need to focus on my bank account. I need to focus on what the news is saying. I need to focus on just holding it all together, man. I'm just barely there. I just need to focus on keeping it all together. Well, let me ask you this question. When we focus first on all these other things, when you focus first on all those other things that are going on in your life, right? Think about all the things. What amount of capacity or focus do you have left for Jesus at that point? Come on. When we fill our hearts and our minds with things here below, we are left without any room or capacity for the things above. Guys, this is so much freedom and stress relief that we're not even taking advantage of. Focusing on things here below gives us massive anxiety and stress. They fill our hearts with temporary things instead of eternal. And what happens when we set our focus the right way? Why didn't you know it? The things down here, down, down below, down here, they don't hold as much weight as they once did. Once we get our eyes focused off of these things and we look up to Jesus, it's like, this is not really that big of a deal. In light of eternity, this is nothing. What we have going on is nothing. All of a sudden, we're focused on Jesus and what he's doing, and the stuff we're suffering through down here is minimized. God says, that's where I need to be in your heart and in your mind. When we set our focus on Jesus first, first on the kingdom, first on what he is doing, then we find he's been working in it all the whole time anyways. This isn't to say that we walk around nonchalant with like an attitude like, well, hello, good morning, Janet. Good morning. You know, Jesus will be taking care of the budget meeting today, okay? La-di-da. I'm just going to continue on my day. Focus on Jesus. Paul... <laughs> Here is clarifying and focusing our hearts and our minds on the higher things. Hearts steadfast and focused on things above where Christ is. Minds steadfast on things above, not on earthly things. Why? Because when we seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things and worries will be given to us as well. Amen. Yes. Does God know your needs? Yes. yes. Does he see your situations? Yes, yes he knows it. Down to the molecular level, as we saw in chapter 1. Set your focus on the right thing, then. And all these other things, he's going to make them happen. He's gonna, you're going to see the faithfulness of God in it. It's getting our focus right. Guys, eyes up here. Eyes up here, right? Get them back on Jesus. When we're looking at him, he's guiding us, fulfilling us, and sustaining us in every area of life. Well, don't I need to keep my eyes on the ground to, like, know where I'm stepping? No, not really. Because if we keep him on Jesus, we see that he's a faithful guide. Faith is complete trust in and reliance on 
to believe in, to have confidence in, and to trust in no matter what comes. Lord, I know you have good for me. You see, Peter took his eyes off of Jesus when he stepped out of the boat. He was walking on water. He took his eyes off of Jesus and sank. Don't sink. Christian, don't even swim. Like, walk on water, baby. That's what, that's what Jesus is saying. Set your focus today. Verse 3, Paul says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We died. Who we were prior to Christ, he says, is dead. We've died to old things. Old life is gone. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he begins that transformative work from death to life, from darkness into the kingdom of light. Remembering to keep Jesus in focus, him at the forefront, it says, when Christ, who is your life, see, he is our new life. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is a promise from God. Remember, Jesus is coming back. You can take it to the bank. He said he would, he will. He's calling us to be ready right now. When we are hidden with Christ, which means united in, joined together with, when he is in us and we are in him, we are covered by the blood. We aren't what we've done or what's been done to us. We are a new life transformed and made holy in the heavenly realms. When we are in him, when he comes back and says, we will appear with him in glory. I think God is calling us to wake up and be ready. Stay focused, Christian. Stay focused on things above. Keep your eyes set on me, he says. He will guide you. I think people today, by far and in large, are sleeping. In almost every church in our area, almost every church, we're only seeing 50%. 50% of people who once went to church are regularly, are regularly attending. Only 50%. Most churches in our direct area, that number is 35%. 35% of people who used to attend before the pandemic, 35% are still going. I think it's time for us to wake up. God is shaking us saying, hey, wake up, stay focused here. I got some work to do here. I, want, I got work to do in your neighborhoods. I've got work to do in your jobs. I've got work to do in your families. I've got work to do in you. Stay focused. Why have we at GCC beat the Great Commandment, Great Commission drum so hard? Why have we dove so deep into who Jesus is, the importance of being united in Christ? Because God is calling us to live out what he's called us to live in. Amen. It's time to wake up. It's time we begin to live out what he's been calling us to live in since the day we first believed. So how do you do that? Here comes the spanking, okay? Don't worry. Verse, verse five, no. point number two, he says, put to death, put to death. Woo. The Lord had his way with me this week, I'll tell you that right now. Let's jump in, verse five. It says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with, your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Paul here begins to first focus our hearts and minds. Then he shows us two ways, vice and then virtue, which we'll see just a little bit in, chapter, in verse 12. Paul contrasts sin with living a life worthy. Darkness Vices, worldly things, he says, need to be put to death. Now, is Paul saying that God will do this? Or is Paul telling us to do this? He's telling us Amen. to put to death these vices, these sins in our lives. It's on us to do it, but in the same breath, I want you to understand something. This isn't within us to do on our own. What did you just say? This is on us to put to death these things. However, apart from Jesus, it is not possible to do it on your own. 
That's where the focus comes in. Jesus first. Critical first step. If we miss that and then expect an open door when we slip into eternity, we're going to be sorely mistaken. What I mean is when someone looks at this list, this thing is going nuts right here. Putting it to death. Spirit putting that stuff to death right now. Burn it up, Lord. When, what happens is when someone looks at this list, and what we've seen, like in chapter 2, is people then try to make a list of do's and don'ts. Are you serious right now? Do <laughs> you need to stab that thing? Get that thing to calm down? Okay, that's fine. People will say, look, let's make a list, do's and don'ts. Here it is, guys, black and white. What you don't do. And then in verse 12 to 14, what you do do. Oh. Not do do. Anyways. <laughs> What tends to happen when we come to a passage of scripture like this is we try to make this a prescription. As if doing or not doing these things makes us holy. All I got to do is pop these pills and then I'm holy, right? Like that's not what makes us holy. It's Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. His blood alone which covers our sin. When we get to heaven, it won't be, look at what I've done. Look at me. Look at me. Look at what I've done. I did it. I followed the list. I did it all on my own. He's going to say, I don't know you. It's rather Christ alone. Christ alone. It's all Jesus. We are hidden in Christ. His righteousness is imputed to us. His holiness covering us. His goodness. His kindness. His forgiveness. His works. Not ours. However, and this is massively important to understand and critical to get into our thinking. With all that being said... When God rescues us from the kingdom of darkness and transforms us into the kingdom of God's triumphant son, the natural result of that is to put off vice and to put on virtue. In this sense, Paul is describing a transformed life rather than a prescription, do's and don'ts. The logical, even expected outcome of being in Christ is to live according to God's will. Paul doesn't speak of one without the other. To embrace the truth about God's grace is to receive God's grace and be empowered for living according to God's will. Christ does the work in us so that he can do the work through us. He saves us not just from hell, right? I, I just accept Jesus and I get to go on living like I... No, no, no. He transforms us here below Amen. in the ultimate preparation for things above. Amen. Amen. You see that? This is about our walk with him. How are we doing in living this out? Paul was speaking to the Christians in the room. This isn't about what others are doing. Okay, I want to make this also super clear because I, I, I heard, I literally, I was sharing this with Janae. I'm reading this and I'm, and I'm studying through this and I could hear people say this. This is like a, this is a list of darkness and sins. We read stuff like this. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. If your first thought is, dang right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Look at all these broken down heathen sinners around here, right? Like, be sexually immoral, calling evil good, and living outside of God's natural law. Look at these impure people out here, lustful, nasty, evil, man, greedy people worshiping their false idols. It's because of you the wrath of God is coming. <laughs> I hear people saying this. Listen, people who are living that way, people who resemble this so perfectly, they are that way because they don't know Jesus. What's our excuse? What's our excuse? God here is speaking to us. This is about our sin. To those who have been raised with Christ. We get so focused on other sins that we're slipping right past the elephant in the room of our hearts. Ignoring them at all costs. We slip right on past the images we're consuming, don't we? We slip right on past the lustful thoughts we're having. The evil desires that plague our lives. The false idol of self-righteousness and say, nah. -uh. Look at those people. Well, how about these people over there? Jesus is saying, look in the mirror, my son. Look in the mirror, my daughter. 
It's the Spirit of God saying, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? <laughs> Paul calls us to put to death the members of the body. The first half of this section there is talking about physical body parts. This is about sensual, sexual desires. Paul says, put them to death. That's what he's talking about in the first half here. But it's not castration. Some of the guys were like, thank you, Jesus, right? It's not about mutilation as we saw last week. That's asceticism and has no value in restraining the sensual desires. It's not about hurting ourselves, but dying to ourselves. My body, my mind wants to do these things which my spirit does not want to do. The Bible says my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. That's true, but it's not an excuse. I have to die to, we have to die to ourselves and our own earthly natures. Put it to death. You might be thinking, but Mike, didn't you say that we can't do that on our own? That's true. So how then do we do it? How do we do it then? Remember how Paul started. Keeping our hearts and minds steadfast and focused on Jesus. Amen. You see, it's staying connected to the vine that the branch can grow. Last week, it was the picture of staying connected to the head. Without the head, the body is dead. Without the head, the body is dead. Believers, you and I are made capable by God's grace to do God's will. He gives us the ability, the power, and the understanding to do it. As believers in Christ, we're made capable by God's grace in order to do God's will. He gives us the ability to do it, the power from within to do it, but now still says, now actually go and do it. Get it straight. He doesn't force us to do this. We're not robots. He doesn't just program us by the Spirit of God and then all of a sudden... We just boop, 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 deleted, boop, 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 boop. and then we walk on in this weird thing. No, we have to choose to do God's will. He makes us capable by his grace to do it. We still have the freedom and choice whether we will or not. Joshua, the great warrior and man of God, said, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, that's okay. Then choose for yourself this day who you'll serve. Whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. In other words, choose one. Who will you serve today? The Lord or the little G God of the earth? Verse 7 says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander. Filthy language, don't lie to each other because you put off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed day by day. Amen. Verse 7 emphasizes that the new life or walk with Christ marks a change from the life in these immoral ways. The NASB translation literally reads, it says it twice, and in them you also walked when you were living in them. The repeated formula makes Paul's critical point to live in vice rather than in Christ means we're choosing to exist in the dominion of darkness. We're choosing that. Choosing to live in vice over Christ is allowing evil forces and powers to shape a self-destructive life of rebellion against God's good intentions for you. He says put him to death. We have to take off our old grave clothes, you guys. Listen, before Jesus, all of us were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we used to live. He says, not just with sensual desires. He says, but now you must also rid yourself of all these other things. He's saying, take off the grave clothes. Jesus has called us out of the grave and into new life. We have to stop putting those nasty rags back on like that's who we still are, right? Like, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to throw on this filthy rag of filthy language, you know? Like, yeah, I can still be hip and... Get down with people. And, no, no, no. Act in the fool like the rest of the world. They have an excuse. They don't know or follow Jesus. We don't have an excuse. We do follow Christ. It's him in us. But this isn't just about a spanking. I know I'm looking at some of your faces. You're like, dang, Mike, that's, that's harsh. The Lord's been revealing some stuff in me, too. He also gives us encouragement and a direction to live. There is life on the other side of these old things and old ways. Sometimes when we focus on what we've done, sometimes when we focus on who we've been, it's hard to know who we are in Christ, isn't it? Because it gets clouded. And we need to come back to that seat, looking at Jesus, come back to the feet of the cross and say, God, I know who you are. 
I want to follow you, that he begins now to transform us. Verse 10 says, put on the new self. You see, there is a new self. Put it on, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Take off the old things and old ways. In them we'll only find pain and death and put on the new self. But won't people call us hypocrites if all of a sudden we start making changes in our attitude and in our language and in our character? Maybe. Who cares? Your new character will outshine and outlive your old character when you choose to walk in it day after day. Who we are in Christ will outlive who you once were if you choose to walk in it day after day. We have to choose to put on the new self. You might say, but I don't feel like I can. God's saying, just take a step in that direction. Take a step in that direction and you'll find that Jesus has given you the power to do it. I'm going to walk in this new life today. Faith is stepping out into the unknown and the unseen, but with the knowledge that Jesus will be there to guide you because he is faithful and he is good. So point number three, going to verse 12, you need to clothe yourself, clothe yourself. So if we put off these old things, we can't stand around naked, right? We've got to like do something about that. So this is what he's talking about right here, verse 12. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, <coughs> gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see, focused on Jesus, it brings into perspective our own sins, our own need for him. The right focus brings a Holy Spirit reminder to walk in his ways. Not just outwardly speaking of Jesus, we ourselves need to be living in connection with him. It's not enough to simply proclaim it. We need to be inwardly living what Jesus called us to live. You can only fake holiness for so long. You can only fake these virtues for so long. In Jesus, he actually gives us the power and ability to live it wholly and completely. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, as God's chosen, holy, and beloved. Did you know that you are chosen by God, made holy by Jesus, and dearly loved? We are beloved of God. That's interesting because God uses chosen, chosen, holy, and beloved to describe Israel in the Old Testament. In that time, apart from being a Jew or a Gentile convert to Judaism, no one else was labeled chosen, holy, and beloved. But now in Jesus, we've been given the same distinction. Welcomed into the family of God and set apart as his holy, chosen, beloved people. Because we're good? No. Because we deserve it? No. Because somehow we've earned it? No. It's because of him. Paul shifts our focus here from the first half to the second half. From the worldly things, the vices of this world, now to the virtues only found in Jesus. He said, take off the old self and put on, clothe yourselves with these. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. He takes the five vices, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language, and replaces them with the redeemed virtues found in Christ. Five for five. He replaces them, covers them. Instead of anger, he says, put on compassion. What's compassion? Insensitivity, show mercy and concern for others. Instead of getting angry with someone for what they do or have done, have compassion, a sensitive concern for them and showering them with mercy. You made me angry today. The anger monkeys are crawling up my back. If anybody's seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Deep breath. Instead, I will be sensitive to your needs and show you mercy and concern for your life. What does that do? It takes away a stumbling block from people and gives a picture of Jesus to others. Compassion for anger. Instead of rage, he says, put on kindness, which is to pr provide something with somebody, something tangible that's beneficial. Instead of raging on someone, you go out of your way to provide for them in some way. Flowers, a Snickers bar, maybe a bag of Starburst jelly beans for the pastor. It's, 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 a, it's a kind act. It's a kind act. It's like, I want to rage on you for cutting me off on the freeway, right? Like, 
But instead, deep breath, I'm going to drive by and give you a genuine smile and a nod. Bless you. <laughs> All for Jesus, right? Like, what does that do, though? Think about it. What happens when you rage? You do things in a fit of rage you would never do otherwise, right? Being kind takes away irreparable harm. Being kind takes away irreparable harm and replaces it with a pathway to peace. Kindness works. Kindness for rage. Instead of malice, which is his bitterness, he says, put on humility, which means lowliness. You lower yourself by lifting others above you. Humility is not just laying on the floor so everybody can see you. That's self-righteousness. Humility is lowering yourself by lifting others above you, first and foremost, right? Make yourself low and lift others up. Not about me, it's about you. I want to let the bitterness set in. I want to hate you for what you've done. But instead, I will make myself low and lift up your needs above my own. What does that do? It shows Jesus. It takes a poison out of your heart and makes you more like our humble Savior. Humility over malice. Instead of slander, talking bad about people, he says put on gentleness, which means to be meek and mild with people. Instead of slandering and talking bad about people, what if we were gentle and mild with them? It's loving people in a softer way. You see, I want to say that you're a terrible human and with a horribly ugly face. <laughs> you're a terrible person. I hate you. But instead, listen, this is real. Okay. <laughs> Act like you have called somebody ugly in your heart. But instead, I will choose to be gentle and soft with you. I love your hair. Not fake, not fake, but actually being soft instead of a hard edge that slander cuts with. What does that do? Instead of cutting and leaving people with a wound, it leaves them with the warmth of a soft touch. Oh, that feels nice gentleness for slander. And instead of filthy language, he says, put on patience, which means long suffering. It's the ability to take a great deal of punishment from evil people without losing your temper. I'm telling you, the Lord's been working on me this week. I'm telling you that right now. Instead of cussing someone out, you show restraint and suffer a long time for their benefit. I want to cuss you out for what you're doing behind my back, but I'm going to choose not to do that. Just like Jesus does this for me every single day. What does that do? It brings us out of the filth and into a virtue displayed by Jesus. Patience for filth. All of these things are virtues found in Jesus. When we do these things, it makes us image bearers of Christ. We're showing a dead and dying world who Jesus is. Are we doing this? Are you doing this? In Jesus, we have the ability and power to live this out. And then in verse 13, it says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against, against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Bearing with each other is a picture of us coming underneath others and lifting them up. It's a load-bearing beam for a bridge. What does a load-bearing beam do? It bears the weight, doesn't it? We hold up others in these ways so that we can provide a path to Jesus. We're load-bearing beams under a road straight to Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> to bear with each other means literally to hold others up. And then he says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We need to forgive others and release people of the guilt that's in our heart, the bitterness that's in our release them. What has Jesus forgiven in you? Jesus said, people will know you are my disciples by this one thing, the way you love one another. Life is too short and eternity is too long for us to hold on to wrongs. Our lives are too short and eternity too long for us not to love people and not only tell them about Jesus, but to live out Jesus in us. We're his chosen, holy, beloved people. In this life, there is a way to attain these virtues. There is a way to put to death our earthly nature and live a new life with all these markers, these virtues. People will say on this side of eternity, no, it's impossible, we can't do it, there's no way. That's a lie. Will we mess this up? Yes. Absolutely. But to say we can never attain this is to say that God's grace and power is not sufficient in us today. 
The result of salvation in the life of God's people is holiness. The list we see here of traditional virtues illustrates the character of holiness that God creates in us. It's the fruits of his spirit. It's compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness, patience, forgiveness and love. All of these virtues found in Jesus. When we are in Jesus, these virtues come alive in us. Let me close with this. In this world, we have strife. We have anxiety and chaos. And all those things create in us the same feelings. When we stay focused on those things, they create in us the same outcome. Garbage in is what? Garbage, Garbage out. out. It's a VBS song. Billy used to sing it all the time. It's the only reason I know. Garbage in is probably telling me something. I see what you're doing, Mike. Garbage in, garbage out. That's the way it used to be before the Lord came and rescued me. I don't know. That's how it goes. Something like that. Did I hit it? Did I hit it? In our sinful nature, we have all these vices that we saw in the first few verses, and they create in us a separation from God. However, in Christ, we have the fullness of peace. Corey Ten Boom once said, If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at God, you will be at rest. Amen. Let's look at verse 15, which we're going to dive into next week. I just want to touch this lightly. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let us not be distressed this morning about our positions. Many of us are probably feeling like I did going over this list. Like we had to move out of the trailer this week. We had so much stress and outside pressure. It was like, oh, my head's going to blow up. I was looking at this and I'm like, I haven't arrived yet. I mess this up all the time, Lord. I mess this up all the time. Listen to the voice of Jesus. He says, my son and my daughter, take a step today. Take a step. I felt spanked after reading this list. And then I felt literally the spirit of God show me how far I've come. He said, my son, do you remember who you were? Do you remember where I pulled you out of? Do you remember where you were? You're right, you and I haven't arrived. On this side of eternity, we never will, fully. A life of faith isn't living a perfect life. A life of faith is a life that moves. It's one marked by change. Here's what I know for a fact. I haven't arrived yet, but I'm further along today than I was yesterday. Amen. I'm further along today than I was last year. And I'm way further along than when I first believed. All because of Jesus leading me. So let his peace Rule in your hearts today. Are you feeling convicted to change? That's great. Take the step you feel he's calling you to take. I believe time is running short. People not coming to church out of laziness or fear or slumber. Allowing the COVID shutdowns and everything going on in the fear to lull them into a sleep. God is calling us as his children to take seriously our walk with him. Amen. Calling us in a deeper relationship with him. And calling us to take his word into our families and neighborhoods and workplaces. Amen. Are you tired of trying to put on a mask of holiness? Take it off then. Come to Jesus and ask him to forgive you. Ask him to guide you. Ask him to take you on the journey of a lifetime. One from death to life. Don't do it. If you can't come to him with a broken heart over your sin, come to him and ask him for a broken heart for your sin. If you can't come to him with faith, come to him and ask him for faith this morning. If you can't find yourself to come in repentance, then come and ask him for the power to repent. It's when we come to him empty-handed, bankrupt in heart, ruined and condemned, that we find rest. Charles Spurgeon said that. Come to him today and you will find peace. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus. God, we come before you today asking for peace. Lord, we know that in this life we get this so twisted and so messed up all the time. We surrender to you again today. We come back to your throne of grace. We kneel at the foot of your cross once more and we ask that you would forgive us of our sins, Lord. That you would wash us clean. You would start afresh in us again this morning, God. 
that as we go about our days, it would be a, a cognizant reminder that you are calling us to put to death these old things. That we would stop going to them. We would stop clothing ourselves with them. God, that we would live in you. Because we know in you is the whole fullness of God. And we know that in you come the fruit of your spirit, God. We know that anything good that comes from us ultimately comes from you. So Jesus, we surrender to you this morning. And we ask that in every way, God, you would be with us in Jesus' name.